Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here, and welcome back to an episode of Stumped Q&A. So this episode, we're going to address the questions and comments that came up after this past weekend's video on stupid bandsaw tricks and also uh, straight cutting and resawing on the Shopsmith bandsaw. And as you can see behind me now, we're having a uh, Shopsmith bandsaw slumber party. This is my neighbor Chuck's bandsaw that uh, he just got from his dad. He's been in his family for a number of years. <clears throat> and I asked if I could borrow it because I wanted to show you something with this old table that used to be on the Shopsmith bandsaw. So we'll get around to that. I also left something out of this last video that I forgot, and that was why would you want to twist the bandsaw blade on the Shopsmith bandsaw? I can't believe <laughs> I can't believe I forgot to share that. So <clears throat> near the end of this video, I'm going to put the footage that I filmed last week that for some reason I left out. So let's uh, start going through these questions. Um, <clears throat> Hal Mann asked a number of questions, and so in no particular order, um, his questions, uh, first uh, question we're going to talk about is he had to adjust his, his fence in order to get a straight cut on his bandsaw by about 10 degrees, and that seems extreme to him. Um, I would say that that's also extreme, and I would say this was extreme. I threw the, uh, the the table back on this bandsaw and just tightened it. I didn't do anything to check it. And that uh, that amount of drift that I was getting to me is an indication that I probably need to rotate that table a little bit. So by loosening the four bolts underneath that, I can rotate the table around until I get uh, a, what appears to be a relatively straight cut. But keep in mind, different blades, different tensions, that will affect the drift. But I should be able to get close. And, and several people commented that on their Shopsmith bandsaw, they don't get any drift at all. And, and that happens to, to be that they, they've got their table perfectly aligned and they probably always resaw with the same width blade. So perhaps if they tried making cuts with different size blades, they might find that they do in fact get drift. But that was uh, Thomas Murphy and Andy Milligan, the show-offs, we're gonna call them from here on out. <laughs> um, Hal also asked uh, or commented about how there is no 5 8 inch tension on the tensioning gauge. He's absolutely right about that too. Um, back when this bandsaw was designed, there was no 5 8 inch blade available for the do-it-yourselfer. Now there is. And so we adjust the blade tension to the half inch mark, and that happens to be perfect for the 5 8 blade. <clears throat> The other question Hal asked is, will a blade drift differently under different tensions? I don't know. It's, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, could be. Uh, I don't know why you would want to set a blade to a different tension other than what the saw was designed to run it. So I, I would suggest that we shouldn't extremely over tighten. We should never under tighten. And uh, if we did that, would it drift more? Maybe. Don't do that. Um, will lifting the top guide change the drift? Now, for example, if you're cutting thin stock and then you adjust the guide up to cut thicker stock. Um, the, the question wasn't, what if I raise this guide well above what I need for the cut? That probably will encourage some drifting. Um, so here's the interesting thing about bandsaw blades. When you begin the cut, if you begin the cut slowly and carefully <clears throat> so that you're not introducing any drift, or there's another issue, if you overload those teeth, that blade will begin to kind of belly out in the cut. And you'll know this <clears throat> when you get this concave on one side of the cut, convex on the other. Of course, they match each other. <clears throat> and that happens because the blade is getting overloaded with sawdust. Um, either you're feeding too fast or you're using too fine a tooth blade for that depth of cut. A uh, rule of thumb that I go by is I try to have about six teeth in the wood. And so if, uh, if I happen to have a, let's say, a six tooth per inch blade, that's ideal for one inch thick stock. Let's say I cut two inch thick stock with that blade. 
if that's the case, I need to slow my feed rate. Okay, if I if I push with the same feed rate that I would with that one inch stock, I'm going to find that it's going to begin to overload that. <clears throat> so um, if you had the blade guides above where you need them to be and you're cutting thin stock, yeah, you're going to potentially introduce. The other thing that's interesting is as you begin to make that cut, the board itself starts to act as something of a blade guide or a guide block. So as long as you're keeping your cut straight, the cut itself will help to guide the blade. Kind of crazy. I mean, <clears throat> the, the blades have set teeth. One is bent to the left, one is bent to the right, and so on. And they, they can vary that, that, uh, that pattern, but basically that's how it works. So they are cutting a kerf that's actually a little thicker than the blade itself. So the blade is moving along behind in that kerf without any uh, resistance or, or a lot of friction. And um, if, if the blade is wanting to drift, that actually might help keep the blade going a little straighter. But uh, it, again, if we're not overfeeding it, that helps the blade to cut straight. Okay, the miter slots seem parallel to the blade, um, but it, it drifts anyway. That's right, remember the miter slot, looking at the blade, and, and eyeballing that to the miter slot doesn't mean anything. It's parallel to the cut is what we're concerned about. Um, Andy Milligan, uh, I wrote Mulligan, I think it's Milligan, uh, says he wants to see a bandsaw trick. Okay, we'll do a bandsaw trick after we answer a few more questions. <clears throat> uh, Hooper57 says, any tips on ways to maximize the cast iron table. I think that that falls into the uh, the next bandsaw trick I wanna show you. But the, the old cast iron bandsaw table has cross slots for the miter gauge. The purpose of that is we get to use the miter gauge as a rip fence or a fence for resawing. Ideally, you're going to take a, uh, a wide board it can be up to six inches wide, and you're going to attach that to the face of the miter gauge. You can either uh, drill and countersink some uh, quarter 20 bolts, and you can make yourself a, a fixture that will slide right on and lock in place with a couple knurled knobs or, or wing nuts on the back. Or what I do, just down and dirty, I'll just stick some two-sided tape on that and stick it temporarily. What that does for us is that gives us then a fence that is very easy to adjust for drift. Notice how I can pivot that any which way I want. So I do the same trick of making the cut following a straight line drawn on the wood. If you didn't see the video, watch the video. I'll mark that line on the table and then adjust the drift. Now the, uh, the distance from the blade to give us the dimension that we need, once we get that distance measured, the Shopsmith miter gauge has a slot in the miter bar, and in the middle of that, there is a tapered set screw. So we can take this, and once we have it in the position that we want, use the Shopsmith toolbox, which is the 532nd hex wrench, to drive that tapered set screw in. And by doing that, that's going to spread that bar, and that'll keep it from moving. If your miter bar is, uh, is worn or if the slot itself is worn, you can put a piece of paper down in there into that slot as you lower the miter gauge. Um, there, there's also the other reason why you might want to do that is you might not want to have to drive the set screw in quite so far, which might make it difficult to remove. So um, let's see, a piece of paper. Here's a piece of paper. So I can take a piece of paper and stick it either completely underneath the miter bar or under half of the miter bar right there at the set screw. And then tighten that down. And just by doing that, I've not drawn that set screw down quite so far and that's gonna make it a little bit easier to remove. Okay. Um, what blade do you prefer on the Shopsmith bandsaw? That's a great question too. Uh, let me see if I've got the package of one here. I usually do. 
Well, actually, this last one I ordered didn't come in a retail package. What do you know? <laughs> it was just up inside the box. Uh, I use Timberwolf bandsaw blades. Uh, they're fantastic. This one happens to be a half inch variable pitch blade. And let's see, it's got, uh, does it say how many teeth per inch? Two to three. There's the variable. Two to three. So that's uh, that's going to allow it to cut thicker stock. Again, following my rule of about six teeth in the uh, wood, I'm going to have to go pretty slow even so with uh, like a six inch piece of wood. And my, uh, my grandson and I started a project. Unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to complete it, <clears throat> but it's, it's actually been in a couple of the videos here where we are taking this mahogany that was given to me by a friend and uh, we are resawing that and using that to uh, create for him a desk in the style of Thomas Jefferson's desk. So here you can see one of those boards that has been resawn. The boards then got planed on both sides. And right now I'm just letting them get acclimated to my garage back here because, <clears throat> because their original finish, <clears throat> excuse me, these were, these were used boards. They were part of a, a bookshelf in a, uh, an old building in, in Dayton, Ohio and uh given to me so we're we're uh we saw those six inches wide did that on the shopsmith bandsaw <clears throat> another thing that i wanted to show you um i've made hundreds of these shaker oval boxes um, the shakers they were a religious sect in the united states uh similar to quakers if you know quakers um and they were very inventive folks. Um, they weren't allowed to have sex, so they had nothing else to do but to invent interesting things. Um, it was a shaker woman who invented the circular saw. Shakers are said to have invented the planer. Um, they invented the flat broom. Before that, all brooms looked like the brooms that Harry Potter flew on. But uh, one of their greatest inventions were these shaker over oval boxes. I guess they probably just called them oval boxes, didn't they? Um, and they're they're very clever in the in the way they're designed. So these were used back in the 1800s for storing things. And uh, there were other people that made round wooden boxes, but the shakers were smart about this and that they understood that. Well, okay, let's say I want to store this screwdriver. With an oval box, I only need to make a box the length of the screwdriver. The width of the screwdriver, or the width of the box, doesn't need to be the same size as the as that. It just needs to be that length. And by making them oval, they have the advantage of not only using less material, but if they did, in fact, make that out of square stock that was the same width as it is in long, they would have to deal with more wood movement. Wood expands and contracts over its width. And uh, this little band right here isn't glued on. This band is held in place by a bunch of little wooden tacks. And the, the swallow tails, as they are called, these joints, they're not glued. They're just tacked in place with uh, copper pins. And so uh, that allows that joint to, to expand and shrink as well. Very smart, so good good use of them of their material, and also it helps to control some of the movement. Interesting thing about the shaker boxes is uh, they they nest together, kind of like uh, my wife's Tupperware containers, right? And they are different sizes. The sizes are are numbered, and there you can see. Oh, this is like one of those little Russian doll things, isn't it? Not quite, but but there are some small ones as well. I think that's yeah, that's the smallest one I have here in this in this set. Um, all of those were bands of wood cut on that bandsaw that I have down the floor. I don't know if I even shown that one there. That one right there. I just brought that one over from my shop. Um, 
thousands of feet of that thin stock. Um, they went from where they were cut on the Shopsmith bandsaw to where I ran them through a surface sander that I created. I built it from the inspiration from a book that came with my Shopsmith, Power Tool Woodworking for Everyone. Um, and all the holes for the, uh, the wooden pegs, also known as toothpicks, those were done with the Shopsmith set up in horizontal boring mode. Um, this, the only power tools I used on this were my Shopsmith tools. So, pretty cool. Okay, let's see. Um, I, I got some papers attached here to see with some more questions. Uh, Wes Shoebridge says that he has the older table. He uses the miter gauge. Is there a better way? That works great. The only downside of this is it's got a small table. But the advantage of the small table is I could lift my drill press up on my Mark V with that bandsaw sitting right there. When they introduced the aluminum table, making it larger and giving us the ability to add some accessories like a, a bandsaw fence, there's a circle cutting attachment, there's a little extension thing you can put on it. Those were all nice. However, you can't lift the machine up into the drill press position. And if you happen to have either the brand new Mark 7 or the 1960s Mark 7, you can't lift it into the drill press position with any of the accessories on it. You always have to take them off. So, um, you know, I, I, I do like that bandsaw table. I replaced mine with the aluminum table when it came out. But there are a lot of times that I miss that cast iron table, um, not the least of which is because of the tilt. I only now run my bandsaw on this uh, stand called the Power Station. So that actually brings up a question that was asked by MRRWMAC, Mr. RW Mac. Okay. Um, he was asking, you know, any advantages, disadvantages to powering on your Mark V using the power station or, or just a standalone stand. You can buy them from Shopsmith, or at least you used to be able to, or you could build one. Yeah, um, the, the bandsaw here on the, uh, on the Mark V is pretty tall, and it brings the table up pretty, pretty high. Um, it is whew, about five inches taller than the table with the bandsaw over here on the shops with power station. Um, I, I like the lower table. And so to me, that gives an advantage to the power station. If you are putting that bandsaw on a stand of its own, it could be any height that you like. The advantage of the power station is I can power all of the accessories with the exception of, in my opinion, the jointer. It runs too slow for the jointer. So um, Shopsmith used to use this, this tagline the tool to start with, the system you grow with. And I think that that's actually pretty smart because, you know, you could start with your Mark V, add accessories to it, but as your space expands potentially in your life, as your wallet expands hopefully in your life, you could separate these out and, and run them on their own stands and uh, then you'll have some great standalone power tools. Hope that answered your question. Uh, let's see. Chad asked. Um, oh, Chad. I was warned there'd be people like Chad. I was told that, you know, you start a YouTube channel with power tools and people are going to start questioning everything you do and the safety of everything you do. And actually, I'm OK with that. Because I want for us to be safe in our shops. I don't want for us to make foolish, take foolish risks, unnecessary risks. So he questioned the fact that I was using the, the tip of my finger as I pushed the board through the resaw operation. So I, I do want to make a case for what I did. Um, here's that board. Here's the piece I cut off. So this was a three-quarter inch board. This eighth inch piece was against the fence and I was pushing with the, actually the fingernail of this piece right here, right? That piece right there that measures a little more than half of an inch. So my finger was well away from the blade. However, if it concerns you and it's your finger, use a push stick, okay? 
Um, you'll also notice in that uh, that clip, I was pulling it through the blade, and really more than anything else, what I was doing was applying some pressure against the fence to make sure I didn't pull it away from the fence. Um, but don't ever copy anybody on YouTube if you think the technique that they're using is dangerous. Just don't do it. Um, yeah, you're going to see me do some things out of my comfort level that maybe you would rather have a push stick, a push block, or something like that. Then you should use a push stick, push block, or something like that. Um, let's see. I don't know how to pronounce your name either. Um, anyway, names below. Uh, reaching over the table to turn off the machine. So what I was doing in the video was I had my tripod set up right here, which was just a terrible place to have the tripod. Um, but you're right, on the Shopsmith Bandsaw, Shopsmith Power, I'm sorry, the Shopsmith Mark V, if I'm cutting here at the bandsaw, I come over here to turn it off. If I'm cutting on the power station, I have to go around the table to shut it off. Um, at my shop, but I haven't done it here, I actually have a switch box that the plug of the Mark V plugs into, and that switch box is mounted on the far end of the machine. Now, that's the opposite of where the bandsaw is, and so I, I have it there because for wood turning, I've been turning some bowls and I've had those bowls come apart, and I didn't want to have to walk past the debris field as those bowls were <laughs> shattering to reach past and get to the switch. So I mounted the switch box right there. Um, a smarter thing to do, and I would do it now, is to mount that switch box with magnets. So that way I could move it from that leg to that leg. And then it would be close to any accessory I might be powering on the Mark V. Normally my joiner just lives there. So uh, yeah, that, that is a thing. Um, Sean asks about cutting joints. Sounds interesting. Yeah, I mentioned you can cut tenons, you can cut dovetails. We're going to do a video on that. This is not that video. Um, let's see. On the Facebook group, Micah said that he was interested in my opinion of the cast iron versus the aluminum table. I really feel passionately about this, and that is if you own a Shopsmith bandsaw with an aluminum table, enjoy it. It's a great table. It's big, you can put accessories on it. If you own a cast iron table, it's great, it's fine. Um, you can put magnetic fences on that if you want to. You can use the miter gauge as a fence. I wouldn't change. I would not either go back to the cast iron or upgrade to the aluminum. But if I, uh, if I had the aluminum one, I would absolutely recommend that you, you get the fence for it and uh, even that extension that pulls out, kind of select. Circle cutter. Now, I cut circles really fast freehand, and I use a jig to sand them perfectly round. So we'll, we'll do that in a future video. Um, and Mike King asked, <laughs> you forgot to explain why you skewed the blade. So let's roll <laughs> that missing footage. So if my Shopsmith bandsaw was the only saw that I had access to, and I needed to cut some boards like this two by four, and I needed to cut them in a place where they weren't gonna fit underneath this arm over here. Um, I, I could turn the board like this and cut it at an angle, but that's gonna waste some material here. Um, I, could, I could raise it upright as long as my boards are, are short enough to fit underneath here and here, which is about six inches maximum. But even then, I'm going to have to tilt them at an angle in order to feed the stock through. And so I'm going to end up with a, a miter and some wasted material. Um, I can do this another way with the shops with bandsaw. All right. I hope that that explains it. Uh, thank you guys for your questions. Just a ton of questions. And they were great. It was a lot of fun. It was a good bit video, I hope, that you find. Um, uh, we're going to shoot another video. It's going to be a brief one that you'll see this weekend because we're actually going out of town this weekend, but, uh, would love your comments there and we'll do a midweek video to address those as well with that, uh, make it a great week and enjoy the holiday weekend.